Hello and welcome to Ethics and Governance Webinar 1 for Semester 2 2017. My name's Courtney. I'm actually the author of Module 1 or the revising author and I've been involved in Ethics and Governance well, teaching it uh, for about 16, 17 years. So the first question is, list the attributes of the profession. Now hopefully you've taken the time to handwrite this, but what I'm going to ask, we've got the chat box open. So for each person, I'd like you to just list one, but it has to be a different one each. And let's see how quickly, I'd love to get this done in like 30 seconds, each of the eight attributes. So each of you, see if you can think of one without looking at the study guide and type away, professional judgment, excellent. What's coming next? Code of ethics, superb. Keep going. Ideal of service to the community, governing body. Excuse me, I've just got some soup. We have an ethos, accountability. Yep, so with accountability, we have this sense of autonomy and accountability. We get to set our own rules, extensive education process. Someone's either memorized that or typing it straight from. Ethos, trust. All right, so we're seeing some good answers there. Have we missed any? Anyone thinking we've missed something? Governing body, definitely. So CP Australia, the Institute of, you know, Chartered Accounts of Australia and New Zealand are examples of governing bodies, body of knowledge. Great. So here's the, uh, the flowchart answer. Now, what we have here is a, what we do with our flowcharts is download it all. This is about 10 pages of the study guide. And if you can just review this and then once a week, have a look at it and think, what do I remember about each of these areas? That's part A of model one pretty much summarized on one page. Now you have to remember what each thing means, and that's what I'm going to talk through tonight. Uh, so people talked about body of knowledge, we saw that, we saw education process, ideal of service, um, autonomy and independence was kind of mentioned, was sort of described as accountability. I'm going to give that half marks, code of ethics, ethos, definitely, professional judgment and governing body. So we got seven and a half out of eight, great start. So what are we going to do tonight? We're going to look at module one, part A, then next week module one, part B. And that's 15% of your exam, and the exam's worth 85 marks. So it's going to be around about 12 or 13 marks on your exam. I think module one's probably the easiest module, it's the shortest. So make sure you pick up these marks, quick, quick sticks. What I'm gonna encourage you to do this week is to make a pledge. Now, you should know what that is, and I'll explain it again at the end of the webinar for anyone who's new, but could you uh, just quickly in the chat box say, Yes, if you've made a pledge. Yes or not yet, but I'm going to. Great. Superb. Not yet, but it's going to. The pledge works. There's science behind it. It's absolutely amazing. And uh, putting, making a pledge in writing and a commitment to yourself and to others guarantees that you will improve your chances of, of, of doing better. So you don't have to, I can't force you, but my encouragement is that pledges work. So we're going to jump into module one tonight. Here are our contact details. So if tonight in the chat box I don't answer your question or you've got a longer question or you need some help, just email me at eg at knowledgeequity.com.au. If you have an admin issue, email inquiries. Here's the Facebook page where you can ask ethics and governance questions. And here's our Facebook page. These slides are available for download and those links are active. So me quickly. I'm a management accountant by trade, but also an academic. I love uh, management accounting. I love accounting in general. I studied at uni, got a passion for it. I love using accounting numbers to solve problems inside businesses. So I did the CPA program in 2000. So SMA, you just had to do it. In the old days, ENG was called Reporting and Professional Practice. I've done that as well. Uh, financial reporting, that was called Core 2 at the time, but done that too. I also used to started teaching that in 2001 at Deakin University for Deakin and for CPA. So I've been teaching the program for about 16 years, roughly, and uh, so I know it pretty well. I've also worked in a couple of manufacturing organisations and we do quite a bit of consulting work as well because I like to practice what we do, uh, not just teaching it. So um, that's me. I, you'll see me pop up as an author on um, Ethics and Governance, Strategic Management Accounting, Contemporary Business Issues, an original author in GSL, and even some of the subjects that no longer exist like the international business. So I guess what I'm, I don't want to brag, but I do want you to be confident that I know what I'm talking about when I go through this. Earlier today, I ran a face-to-face -face session on contemporary business issues. And what was good is, because it's on module one, it's like, well, when I wrote this, this is what I meant. So I, I get to at least uh, explain things and I know I'm not guessing or making it up. That's uh, one thing that I have confidence on. So what we've emailed you already is 
how to prepare for the webinar. And if you signed up a bit late, you might not have got this, but this is available in our main course. So every week, get into the main course, read, and, and we give you a clear structure, watch. We always say, watch the short videos, then read. You only have to read sort of 19 pages for this week to hit the ground running. Start making your index and summary notes. Everyone always asks us for indexes and summaries, and we always say no, that's a bad learning outcome. It's best to build it yourself. And then the warm-up question and the market control. So we'll look at that. We've already done the warm-up question. Fantastic. Eight attributes of the profession. And uh, let's keep moving. So in the overall subject, we've got eight objectives. And this is what your exam is going to be on. So I always want to bring back our webinars to this content. So in module one, we cover off on objective one and two, the nature of the profession, the role of accountants. Module two looks at ethics. Module three looks at governance. Module four looks at stakeholders and regulation. And module five looks at accountability and CSR. So as you do the modules, you tick off the objectives, you are prepared for the exam. Tonight, we're looking at module one and we'll be looking at objectives one and two, the nature of the profession and the roles of accountants. So what happens later on? In two weeks time, we look at module two and that's on ethics. Then we go into this concept of governance. What is governance? How do we lead direct control organisations? From there, we look at the different stakeholders within companies and all the wrestling that goes on, the consumers, the suppliers, how do we deal with stakeholders and also competitors? And finally, we look at accountability, corporate social responsibility, social factors and environmental factors. That's the future of accounting. So if you like module five, excellent. You've chosen the right profession, but a lot of students kind of hate it. They think it's not real accounting. It's all weird. It's all about the environment and, and figures about waste and water and kilograms. That's the future. Pure financial reporting is evolving into this much broader area. So it's setting you up for your career in a much broader type of accounting. So that's the big picture of ethics and governance. Now we look at module one and there are five objectives. Can anyone, anyone remember what's the percentage mark allocation for module one? It popped up earlier in the timetable. Oh, people are quick, 15, fabulous. 85 mark exam and 15%. So. That from that, you can work out how many questions you're going to get, 12 or 13. And those 12 or 13 are going to be based on these five areas. Now, they shouldn't all be on one topic or the other. It should be spread reasonably easily. We don't know. CPA, choose the exam. This is what the exam should be based on. So can you describe the nature and attributes of the profession? There are eight attributes, so you should be examined on these attributes. And co-regulation or autonomy and self-regulation is one of the key attributes. You can get examined on that. So you should get, hopefully, let's say three questions here, one or two questions here, one or two questions here. Uh, evaluate the challenges faced by the, the accounting profession. I, I put three questions there. We're going to look at that next week. And the role in the importance of soft and technical skills. So roughly one to, to two here, three, I'm going to call that three, and all of a sudden, I've had a guess that this is where you're going to get the marks. Now, am I 100% correct? No. Um, there's slightly different variations of the exam out there, but I reckon I'm going to be pretty close. So if you learn these five objectives, you'll be able to answer these 10 to 12 to 13 questions confidently and move on to the next topic. So what are the module uh, topics here? And this is a kind of mind map. What is a profession? What are the attributes of a profession? What are the regulations that uh, happen in CPA? What's going on in society? And finally, what's happened to accounting credibility? Because we've got smashed. In the last 15 years, accountants have been involved in some significant problems. To bring that back up, we've had credibility issues and now we're trying to restore that credibility. So let's jump into objective one. And, and what I'm showing you this evening as well is this my style. So tell some stories show you the objective, give you the content link to that objective. So you can always see that I'm covering off on the key areas of the study guide. So if you've logged into our main course already, what you'll find is that we structure it pretty specifically. So you get to the first unit and it's called accountants as professionals, right? And it says, skim read the contents page and then watch the video first. What is a professional? So we've got a clip there. It's only two minutes, 10 seconds long. What does it mean to be professional? And then we've got a five minute clip on the attributes of the profession. So all of those things like the body of knowledge and the ethos and the code of ethics and the governing body. 
Then we have some flow charts and questions to really make sure you understand it. And then it says, once you get to the end of that, now read page 19 to 29. So if you watch these videos, do the quiz, do the reading, you will make it to the end of the study guide. We, we cover every single page and you can be confident that you stay on track. So let's see how well you remembered that first task. You can just use the chat box, A, B, C or D. Awesome. Really quick and prompt responses, which is great. So professional skepticism is important, but it's not an attribute of the profession. It's a key requirement for accountants, but not professionals in general. So one thing to learn with CPA questions is you can often have lots of good sounding answers, but they're not the exact or the best answer here. So definitely ethos and culture, ideal of service and govern environment. So which of the following is not one of the four E's? This is quite a, this is for people who've read the materials, otherwise you won't really know. So seeing some A's, couple of C's, one D. Let's have a look at the answer. Excellence. So I was just a bit tricky there. The word is expertise, which is slightly different. Expertise is more about your technical knowledge Excellence is how you perform that work. You know, did you do the excellent work with due diligence and care and thoughtfulness and expertise mixed together? So expertise and diligence creates excellence. Education, ethics and entrepreneurship. Now, one of the key points in the study guide here is too much entrepreneurship can harm your objectivity. So objectivity, and we'll look at this in module two, is about being without bias. It means you can look at something and make a fair judgment because you're not influenced by one party or the other. But if you get too caught up in making tons of money and growth and exciting options, then you can lose your objectivity. So back to the attributes of the profession. I'm going to keep coming back in today's session to this. And if you can, you don't have to memorize this mind map, but you have to know it very strongly. And then you know, four or five exam questions, absolutely sorted. So let's pull it apart. First of all, body of knowledge. What does that mean? Another quiz for you. All right, people are good. Well, I'm on through these. So what I've given you here is four items that are part of a profession, but the first three relate to body of knowledge. But this one actually relates to a different section, which is the extensive education process. So what we have is a body of knowledge. And when you went to university, this is what you studied. And it was formed by systematic research. People have been doing research into accounting and GAP, generally accepted accounting principles and constructing theories. You might remember positive accounting theories and normative accounting theories, different ways of doing, you might've heard of uh, historical cost accounting, compared to COCO, continuously contemporary accounting or current cost accounting, all of those are theories and ideas and systems for doing the accounting. So we've got to have a range of skills and experience. And think of some people know tax law inside out, other people know audit incredibly well, other people management accounting and activity-based costing and all of those linked to theories and concepts and research in practice that informs what we do. So how do we build a theory? Lots of little pieces, that have to be pulled together into something systematic that help explain what's going on. So in accounting, lots of events happen in a business, lots of activities going on. We have developed things like double entry accounting and a conceptual framework, assets, liabilities, non-current, current balance sheets, income statements, cash flows, cash flows listed by you know operating, investing, financing. We've done all of that by piecing all these things together to say people want to allocate their, their financial resources, and they need help making those decisions. Accounting information helps them do that. This is how it works. So that's how we do three construction. Uh, the conceptual framework, a lot of people don't really like it. I think it's fantastic. It talks about what is good accounting information. Good accounting information has qualities such as it's relevant, so I can use it to make a decision, and it faithfully represents the truth of what's going on. It's not just marketing spin. And so I can compare one company to another. I can compare one year to a previous year. I can verify, I can vouch for those transactions 
that have been properly recorded. It's timely, so it's not out of date. I can make a good decision and it's understandable. I know what it means. So good accounting must have good quality. And from this, we can do our income statement, balance sheet, cash flows and our management reports because we have a good theory, a good conceptual framework of why we do what we're doing. So that's financial reporting. What about uh, management accounting? Well, we talk about things like getting the tax right, getting the managerial accounting right, supporting decision making, performance evaluation, do pay people the right bonuses, what's the right way to reward someone. All of this comes back to a good body of knowledge of how things are done. If you set up a terrible reward scheme that makes people cheat and lie and misbehave, that's because you haven't gone back to the body of knowledge to find out what's the best way to reward people, to stop them gaming and manipulating the system. So that was number one. Number two, education process. Go to university, get a traineeship or an internship or, a, or, or your first job. So you get theory, combine it with practice. So you get the ideas and you see what really happens in reality. Once you do that, you get your professional accounting program, you do your CPA or your CA, and over time you do PDs, continuing professional development, supposed to do 120 hours every three years and you follow this path and it's an ongoing education process so you don't just graduate and say now I'm ready you've got to keep on improving so that's what a profession has it's not enough to just learn a couple of skills and then stop there there's this constant and ongoing process so I would cover it off on two key factors Next, the ideal of service. And someone uh, wrote this in caps lock, which I thought was fantastic. We have to do more than just make ourselves rich. We're not just here to get wealthy. We are here to serve. So what does that mean? Three areas of service. We want to lift society up. Is society better because of accountants or worse? Now I'm going to say that sometimes we help. We can help people who don't know much about money make good decisions, create a budget, invest wisely, get secure in their lifestyle. But we can also try and pinch it from them when we give bad financial planning advice just to get a commission. We, we aren't helpful to society when we help people cheat on their tax or fraudulently misrepresent financial statements. That's when we're being very self-interested. So we want to lift up society so it's better because of our advice. We want to pursue excellence, that idea of um, great knowledge and capability and good effort, diligent work. And we, we support the community with pro bono or free work. So we might join committees of schools or charities or sporting clubs and provide that useful financial knowledge that we have. So we serve community with our knowledge and our capabilities. So the other thing that leads to is this concept, we'll talk about more in module five, of the social contract. Uh, anyone want to have a quick type what they think a social contract might mean? It's quite a it's hard thing to type out quickly, but have a quick think about that. What is a social contract? So you've got this obligation to serve, some type, and that's a key component of a social contract. It's less than a, a formal legal contract or a business contract. A couple of other people are typing, so we'll give that a moment to appear. But I just want you to think carefully about this term because it's going to come up in module one, module two, module five. So you really got to be comfortable with it. So trust of society, definitely. Accountants need society's trust. We, we serve and we build trust. <laughs> That's a great question. If someone's boasting about evading tax, what can you do about it? You could blow the whistle. You could do a secret report. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have a legal obligation to do anything at the moment? No, you're not legally obliged. Are you ethically obliged? I would argue it's good to say something. Obligation to serve like doctors, definitely. Someone's written, society grants you permission to operate. So you owe it. Yeah, it's a bit of a let's work together. So they give you permission to act as an accountant, which gives you wealth, status, prestige, um, power in the community. But in return, you have to serve. So, so you're doing a deal. It's not a written down deal. It's a social contract. And when accountants break that contract, which they did in the 2000s, then we have a reduction in credibility and we lose our professional status. Yes, yeah, so someone said invisible contract. Exactly, it is invisible to act for society and we cannot uh, breach that or we'll lose our license to operate. 
and Anderson, a big accounting firm, one of the big five, now there's big four, one of them totally disappeared because their breach of social contract was way too strong. So that's the third area of attributes in the profession. Then Enron scam was another clear example where accountants were terribly uh, inappropriate, dishonest, or just unprofessional, didn't investigate, didn't ask questions, didn't explore harder. In Australia, there's been some recent ones. You know, I get pretty cross about what's happened at 7-Eleven. All these people significantly underpaid and all the accountants and head office, they knew about that uh, and didn't say anything. So what is autonomy and independence? And the bike there is, you know, taking the training wheels up. I can do this by myself, mum and dad. Watch me ride without any help and support. Autonomy is the idea where you get to set your own rules. So have a quick attempt at this question. Couple of people have picked B. Someone's picked a couple of people E. You'll notice that I'm using questions sometimes to, to bring you back to concepts just to really make you confident and reinforce them. Great. So A, C, D, and E are all objectives that we have to cover off on. B is nearly right, and in the old edition it was correct, but it's moved from self-regulatory. The accounting profession used to set the accounting standards and police ourselves, but we lost some of that authority because we broke the social contract. So now we call it co-regulation. We regulate with the government because they don't trust us fully to do it ourselves because we haven't done it right. So that I hope it will just help you remember the objectives a little bit more clearly. And this is objective two. So we've already looked at um, a couple of the attributes, don't worry, we'll finish off the others, but you'll notice objective two is so important that this one attribute is given additional time in the study guide, quite a few extra pages of notes, therefore it's going to get more questions in your exam. Next question for you. Lots of people picking, maybe that was too easy, but you know what's interesting? In the past, we used to be able to set those CPA Australia, when I say we, but the accounting profession determined things like fees and you couldn't go too low because that was not good for the look of the profession and you weren't supposed to charge excessive fees. But uh, in, in the modern commercial world, that's, that's slightly changed. So this is part of it, this is part of it, this is part of it. So we can discipline members if they misbehave. They do have to do continuing professional development, 120 hours every three years. And there are entry requirements such as having a degree, meeting certain uh, practical experience requirements like three years before you can call yourself this because having the letters after your name is powerful. So we have to make sure that people who use it are certified. So how does the, the normal attribute of the profession is high autonomy, self-governing, uh, and independence. But as I said, we lost a bit of that. So the accounting profession now combined with the government means we have co-regulation. So what does that really mean in practice? Well, for example, the Financial Reporting Council oversees the creation of accounting standards in Australia, the double ASB, and also oversees the AUASB, the Auditing and Insurance Standards Board. Now the Financial Reporting Council in the old days, the AASB and the AUASB reported to the accounting bodies, but the government said, no, I'm going to take some of that away. I'm going to start with a financial reporting council, government oversight to make sure that these standards are properly created and also can be enforced uh, by a court of law. In the past, they might be optional and you had a choice to do it. So accountants had a lot more choice and autonomy, and that's been taken away. Now, if you want to watch a little bit more detail on that, we've got uh, Thiarshan. So for those of you who've seen him in financial reporting or audit, he's got a, a video. It's about four and a half minutes long, and it goes through this co-regulatory structure step by step and ticks off. As you'll see, when you read through the LMS, it tells you which objective you're, you're sort of dealing with, briefly explains the clip. If you watch that for four minutes, then read the study guide, you should have a pretty detailed understanding of the material from there. Next one audit regulation.
which of the following is the most correct? A CPA can often give you a question that has four correct answers, but one is better than the others, goes into more detail, it's more specific. So we're seeing a lot of C's and D's here, so let's check it out. A is technically correct. Auditing standards do have the full force of law, but it is not the best answer. The best answer is D because they have the full force of law and auditors also have to comply with the code of ethics. So APS 110 is the code of ethics and they are legally obliged to comply with it. So this is not correct because they are enforced by the law and uh, no legal requirement for auditors to comply. That's not correct either. So A and D are both accurate, but D is more detailed and specific, so it is the most correct. So co-regulation, what happens to government and the accounting profession? Ah, oh, here we go, another quiz, quiz question for you, trying to keep you on your toes on the very first day. All right. So the FRC, the Financial Reporting Council, is a government appointed body that oversees the AASB and the AUASB. So that came up a couple of slides ago. Let me bring it back. So FRC reports to government and therefore so do the AASB and the AUSB through the FRC. So what we have is FRC is under control of the government and therefore the AASB is under control of the government and so is the AUASB. But this one, the APESB, which sets the APES, like the Code of Ethics, APS 110, is an independent body. And I'll, I've got a slide talking about them a little bit later tonight. So how does co-regulation work? The government, through the FRC, oversees the auditing standards and the accounting standards. So I showed that slide earlier. And then we have the accounting profession. This is this, where they do the regulation is the APESB, and they set the APES standards, such as 110, the Code of Ethics. And here we have the Chartered Accounts Australia New Zealand, the IPA, they've got a new logo out, but this one will do for now, and the CPA logo. So that's how co-regulation, if you want, like we have one page that summarises the attributes of the profession, we have one page that summarises how co-regulation works. So when you're studying, we often recommend, yes, you'll need your written notes and index, but if you have these pictures or flow charts, it will help you talk through all the points to yourself, bring them into your mind and speed you up in the exam. So we're halfway through the attributes of the profession. Now we get to the code of ethics and module two goes into this in a huge amount of detail. So I'm only going to touch on it very quickly. The policy of expected behavior, how do accountants behave? And APS 110 specifically. So we have integrity, objectivity, competence, due care. That's really two things, but they put it in one professional behavior and confidentiality. So integrity, straightforward, pure, truthful, not withholding relevant information. Objectivity, without bias, able to give a, a good analysis without being conflicted, being technically capable and diligent. So this leads to excellence because you're capable and you, you apply the right amount of effort. Behaving appropriately and keeping secrets confidential, not sharing things that you're not allowed to. So the next uh, concept is ethos. Which of the following best describes? So another one of those tricky questions, isn't it? Which one's the best? Is it values and norms? Is it customs and ritual? Symbols and traditions or values and tradition? Let's have a look. Values and norms is the way it's described in the study guide. Now, if you haven't read the study guide carefully, you think, oh, they all look kind of okay. So norms, if you don't know this word, What's normal around here? What's, how's the way people normally behave is how we talk about norms. Values is what do we believe in, what's appropriate. And as accountants, our values are integrity, objectivity, confidentiality. These are things that we stand for. So we have an ethos and culture. Now in law, and, and some of this is how we look, how we present. So what do lawyers do? They wear a wig, they wear a gown, and there's this, these symbols of law that promote their culture. Then with CPA, we have our own logo, and it's a little bit grainy in the image here, but a key word, a foundation stone of our ethos is integrity, which is upright, pure, transparent, honest, straightforward. That's what we wanna be. That's what we're known for. So someone, imagine this. 
If you say to the word to someone, used car salesman, what comes into their mind? Real estate person, what comes in? Politician, what comes into their mind? Doctor, what do they think of? Accountant, what's the first thing that comes into their mind? Now, for some people, accountants have a lot of credibility. They can be trusted. They help them with difficult financial decisions, integrity. For others, they go, oh, that's the person that helps me cheat on my tax. Fraudulent, dishonest, sneaky. We want to make sure we have the right values, norms, and symbols, which we create. <laughs> Scam artists. Yeah, hopefully that's not us. I don't really want to spend the rest of my life everyone thinking that I just help people cheat on their tax. That's not what I do. So our ethos, our culture, what do we stand? And as I mentioned, there's the lawyers. Uh, in, so, so some of the professions that are famous, medical, lawyers, uh, religion, so ministers of religion is often seen as a profession. And so they have their symbols. They'll often wear a collar to indicate this, or they'll have robes, or they'll have a, a shepherd's hook or a crook. And then, okay. So once again, we have another short clip. So everything I've talked about today actually has, if you, you work through accountants as professionals, goes through the attributes, then regulation and judgment talks about co-regulation and professional judgment, which is another attribute. And that's part A of module one. Then these clips talk about part B. So there's another three minute clip here. What is professional judgment? And then we have these short quizzes. Now these quizzes are easy. Um, the module quizzes are a bit harder and then the practice exams are harder again. So what is professional judgment? It's the ability to diagnose plus the ability to solve a problem. So you cannot, I don't know, it's a little bit old now, but the TV show House, do people remember watching that? So House was this, each week a, a patient would turn up with really tricky problems and the, the big issue was, <laughs> you loved it, that's great. Well, that's, that means you're connecting with this idea of professional judgment. They, they didn't know the answer straight away. They had to diagnose what was going on. And it was often really tricky because you have to look at all of the, the facts and all the data and run the tests and go, what is going on here? And if you don't have a head full of knowledge, you couldn't figure it out. Not only do you have to diagnose, then you have to say, what do I do next? So when we walk into an accounting uh, client relationship or a consulting engagement, the hardest thing to start with, see, see, we know all our tools and techniques. We know all about, you know, working capital management and debt and equity and do this and fix this and change this and build a costing system. I know that. But sometimes figuring out what the client actually needs, what's their problem, what do they really need, is quite tough. So you have to spend a bit of time figuring it out and then knowing what tool, what technique should I use to solve this problem. And that's what we call professional judgment. And it takes a long, long time. Think about a musical instrument, someone playing the piano, playing the violin. It takes thousands of hours to become an expert. Playing tennis, look at Roger Federer and, and, and these other players. Hundreds and thousands of hours to become instinctively talented. And in accounting, in business, you have to have spent the hours to know how to deal with a particular situation. Chess players are the same. They need to play many, many games so that they know what to do in a new environment, in a game that they've never seen before. So air traffic controllers, that's a perfect example of going, all of this information coming towards me, this person's running out of fuel, this one's flying too close to here, this person doesn't know how to fly without, you know, in the clouds, what do we do? How do I solve this problem? How do I make sure that we don't have terrible accidents in the sky? So a lot of professional judgment. In accounting, we have to use it every day. What accounting policy do I use? What depreciation rate should I use? Should I use this or this level? What's the impact of that reporting? Is something probable or not probable? So is it virtually certain? And, and people always, whenever I teach financial accounting, they go, okay, so, so how, what percentage is likely? How do I know? And it's like, I can't give you that percent. I can't just say this is the answer. You have to use your judgment. Is it remote? Is it more likely than not? This is where our talent and our skill builds up over time. So that's the seventh of the eight. And now we move to the governing body who sets the rules and the requirements. So the fact that you've enrolled in the CPA program means you've submitted to the governing body. You've, you've applied, they've accepted you, you're enrolled in their course, and you're on the path to becoming a professional accountant. So what is the market control view of accounting? Now that we're looking at, we've looked at eight attributes. All right, most people are onto this one pretty quickly. 
monopoly creation. So the traditional view of the accountants, which is called the functional view, and that's what I've been talking about here. This is the traditional view. Accountants are professionals. They work very hard. They build up a body of knowledge through education, and then they serve with that. But others have a slightly more simple view, and they say that it's we, we form a profession more about self-interest. We want to control the market for accountants. We don't just want anyone helping with tax returns or giving accounting advice. We want to protect it, a bit like a union will only let union members work on a work site. So what we're saying is, you're not allowed to practice as an accountant, only I can. And if we can stop everyone else doing it, we can keep the, the rewards for ourselves. We can push the prices up, lower competition, and better returns. So that's a more cynical view where we have this monopoly creation, which is the market control view. So we have the traditional view, which is the eight attributes, and we have the market control view, which is more cynical. It says accountants are only interested in themselves, making themselves rich and protecting themselves. So they have these rules, things like companies must have an audit. Why? Not really audits for the people out there. Audits will keep accountants busy and make us wealthy. So that's market control, market capture. So the bonus question, and there's something we're going to be using this semester. And we, we started trialing it last semester, we'll continue with it. And we call it the Dis Distinction Plus students. And you'll notice from our, our pass rates, I mean, if I can just bring that up quickly, the thing that we're really, really proud of is this number here. So for ethics and governance, uh, people who got distinctions and high distinctions across all of CPA was about I don't know, 11, 12%. We're up at about 24, nearly 25%. What we want is to encourage people well beyond getting a pass and move into that distinction, high distinction category. So the way we want to do that is we want to push you with more work. So we're calling that the distinction plus kind of work. And each week we will try and give you that extra bit of work to keep you busy. So this one, do you believe in the traditional market control view and why? Your, your job here is to handwrite an answer. Don't just think about it because you're practicing for your exam. And in your exam, there's written answers, so you have to practice right. I believe in the market control view because I think accountants are a little bit sneaky and self-interested and da da da. Or I prefer the traditional view. I think a lot of accountants genuinely want to serve their community and look after their clients. Or you might call it a mixture of the two. So that's a distinction plus bonus question that we want to encourage you to do. So uh, I, there is no correct answer there, just your opinion. I hope you gave it a shot. Next quiz question for you. Lots of questions to keep you on your toes tonight. So the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Australia did exist. It just doesn't exist anymore because it turned into the Chartered Accountants of Australia and New Zealand. IPA exists. It used to be called the NIA, National Institute of Accountants, and they call themselves the Institute of Public Accountants. So there we go. Uh, that's a summary of our attributes of the profession. So I keep showing you that slide. During semester, you're going to hear about the rule of seven. And seven is the number of times you need to interact with information to turn it into knowledge and deeply remember it. So if you read the study guide once, your chance of remembering it is, is very, very slim. If you read it once and then highlight key points and then write out an index and then type out some summaries and then read that index and those summaries and then do the practice questions and then watch a webinar and watch some short videos, all of a sudden you're seeing this content seven times and it pushes from short term memory deep into your long-term memory, which means you can bring it up quickly and easily, not just in your exam, but in five years, 10 years, 20 years, which is the purpose of this deep education process to make you a professional. Uh, someone said, uh, is it possible to submit for review and feedback? Yes, you can email it to me, eg at knowledgeequity.com.au, and I'll, I'll be able to give you some feedback. How to manage time to do all these things. It, it takes a lot of time, but, <laughs> It's, it's one of those things where you just plan really carefully. So for me to study ethics and governance, we, we tell people put in 100 hours, 10 hours a week. So to read module one will take most people, I don't know, two or three hours, maybe four hours. Then you've got to spend another six hours summarizing, indexing, going over. But what it means is you, 
you'll get through the first time because you'll do really well. Sometimes people don't do enough study, but then they have to study the subject again. So they end up spending even more hours than if they just did it really well the first time. But the hardest thing really is to, yeah, finding that time is incredibly tough. Especially, there used to be a 13 week semester, now there's 10. That's pretty, pretty difficult. So the APESB is the uh, Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board. Now remember, the FRC is the government controlled arm of the co-regulation. So FRC looks at AASB and AUASB, and then the APESB, lots of initials here, so I hope you remember them all, is the accounting controlled one. Let me just bring that up. So this is the government end. They have the ASB and the AUASB, and here is the APESB co-regulated the accounting profession oversees this section. So I'll uh, just going to come back to that. So what do they do? First of all, the auditing standards have the force of law. This was established in 2005. So in about 2001, 2002, Enron, WorldCom, a whole bunch of organisations start falling over and everyone starts saying the accountants are not trustworthy, totally dishonest. So we want to increase public confidence so we have this organisation form or this entity form to provide professional and ethical standards to improve what we do. We want to move away from self-interest in setting standards. So we want to look objective and independent. Why weren't we in the first place? Well, that's a bit sad. And we'll look at that next week when we look at factors hurting credibility of the profession. So we published APS 110, the Code of Ethics, and that is supposed to try and improve things and restore credibility. So how does CPA and the other professional accounting bodies maintain quality? So one of the things that with co-regulation is you can force accountants who call themselves CPAs to behave in a particular way. So there's standards that are set. So if you do professional practice, if you give accounting advice, standards are there and you have to conform with them. Then people from CPA will, will check that your practice is in order. And if it's not, you can lose your status and your standing. So accounting firms are regulated, how they contract, how they hold money in trust for clients so they don't just steal it or have it disappear. And then there's an APES, like there's APS 110 Code of Ethics, APS 320, quality control for firms. So have you got the right documentation? Do you keep your files up to date? Do you communicate properly with your clients? Have you got a proper fee schedule? Do they know what's expected? To stop you ripping them off, ruining their life, damaging the reputation and the profession. And uh, more regulation is our ability to do professional dis discipline on members. So if there's a complaint raised, they can take action against you. So you might have uh, joined CPA dishonestly, you might have become insolvent, you might have done a terrible job for your client and they're very, very upset. So they can take action by making a complaint. So question for you, which of the following is not a type of complaint. And hopefully you've had a chance to read the, the constitution here. So comparative advertising, becoming insolvent, failing to observe and obtaining an admission. Kind of gave it away in the previous uh, dot points, but in the past, you weren't allowed to do any advertising because you were a professional, not a business person. Then advertising was allowed, but you weren't allowed to do comparative type things, but legally you are allowed to compare as long as it's fair and as long as it's appropriate. So, I'm just... Uh, so step one in the complaints process and, and what I've done is create a flowchart from the text from the materials. A complaint is lodged in writing, and then there is an MPC. An MPC reviews the complaint, and then uh, either no further action, it's, you know, I'm going to ignore it, or open a file and give it from the MPC to the PCO. Now, will you need to know this level of detail? Who knows? It's an open book exam, so they can ask you. It's a little bit too detailed, but just in case you've got it here. The PCO, has the file. They contact the member because it's not fair to have some, if someone accuses you of something, you should have a right to reply and explain what's going on. Then the PCO investigates and reports back to the MPC. So the, the MPC receives it, sort of decides if there's a case, gives it to the PCO to investigate further, and then the PCO 
reports back to the NPC. Then the NPC says, yes, there's a problem, or no, there's not, makes a recommendation to the CEO. Uh, this is a bit interesting because CPA doesn't have a CEO at the moment, but shortly they will. And then the CEO determines if there's a case to answer. From there, either no further action, or it goes to the disciplinary tribunal, or if it's a minor matter, a one-person tribunal. The MPC gives it to an ICM, so another person's been introduced, the investigating case manager, who prepares the case and presents it at a hearing, and then a determination is made. Now, you might say, I'm not turning up to that. You can't force me. You're not the law. You're not the police. You're not the government. True, but if you join CPA, you submit to the CPA's autonomous process because we're a profession, and so we have some level of self-governing. That's what's taking place here. Now, if you refuse to comply, well, then your membership will be forfeit and a ruling will be made against you. But that's how that, that process works. So uh, with that, a couple of question marks up on the screen. Any, any questions on the complaints process uh, or does that come up nice and clear for you? I'll assume everything's good, uh, but you can, someone's typing in the chat box, I'll, uh, I'll give you a chance to answer that shortly. So what have we done? We've done the nature and attributes of the profession. And everything I've talked about today is summarized in those short videos. We've talked about co-regulation as well. Next week, we move on to part B. So part B talks about roles, relationships, and activities. There's not much detail here other than you can work for a big four, you can work for public sector, you can work for a public practice, you can work in business. Uh, we have challenges, lots of challenges because we've had reduced credibility. Why? Our credibility was hurt because of creative accounting, misleading reporting, um, bad accounting standards, just unprofessional behaviour, and that's hurt us, but we've tried to put in place um, situations to improve things. Can the CPA take action against the company as a whole? Not really, because but they can only take action against a CPA member. Now, if it's a CPA practice, then yes, because if it's failing to meet its quality control of the firm, then you could, you could deal with them in that way if it's a public practice and the, the people hold a CPA Australia public practice certificate, but not against the company. That's very unlikely. Do you need to know the bylaws and constitution? Yes, you don't have to memorise them, but you have to know that they exist. And, and the, I think you have to only read a couple of the bylaws and a tiny, maybe clause 39 of the constitution. So I would make sure you've got that printed out, ready to go. Chance of the question, very, very low but it's an open book exam and students will always say, oh, I can't believe they asked such a specific question on such an obscure topic. So yeah, you do need to, you need to read it and be familiar, but certainly you don't have to memorise it. Can a person appeal a case if the person does not agree? There are some grounds for appeal if you read through those laws, but generally not. You agree to be bound by it and often you can't have legal representation either. So. The decision is made, the judgment is made. If you if you reject it, you can refuse to comply. They can't force you like the police and the government and the law courts to pay a fine, but they can forfeit your membership and refuse to allow you to call yourself a CPA in the future. So there's limited recourse to appeal in most situations. Okay, so we've got the end of, of session one. A little bit shorter than the hour today just because it's day one of semester and, and we've only got part A to cover. But my strong encouragement to you, by the middle of this week, by Wednesday or Thursday, Friday at the latest, make sure you've read part A. It's only like 13, 14 pages long. And uh, so you, we recommend you read it after watching all our short videos. Then prepare some summary notes and an index. And, and I gave some examples of that in the winter school session. And I've got a few slides to go through for anyone who's brand new to knowledge equity and wants to ask questions and hang around. I'll, I'll stick around for another 10 minutes. Um, so, and then I'll answer the questions in the chat box in just a second. But what we've got, so next week, to prepare for next week, you need to watch the role of accountants video. It's only two minutes 20, social impact, three minutes, and accounting profession challenges. So you, there's only, in the end, it's not very long to watch these clips. And so if you work through these two units here, and then there's a practice quiz and some reading to do, you'll, you'll have mastered module one, 15%, roughly 12 marks, and your competence levels of successfully performing the CPA exam will, will keep on with you. Uh, let me just, uh, as you read the preparation for next week, I'll answer these questions. 
can I find the slides and video on the Knowledge Equity webpage? Yes, you can. So if you go into our main course, the slides are already available and the, the webinar tonight will be available as a recording within, normally within one hour, but maximum four hours. Uh, can I give you some tips on indexing? Yes. Uh, let me, I've got some slides on that, so I'll talk to indexing in just a minute. Uh, let's see if I bring them up. So, but in winter school session four, I ran that on Tuesday, uh, last Saturday, and the, the information in winter school is uh, recorded in the winter school unit. Go to session four, and it's got a whole detailed section on how to take study notes, how to do revision, and that should help. Uh, any podcast you can download, look at the moment. No, we, we did our first podcast recordings last Friday. They haven't been edited yet, and we will continue to improve our podcasting ability. It's harder than it looks. Um, so at the moment, you can't, you have to log onto the site and watch. Um, someone's asked, why is there no practice exam for EG? Uh, we have two practice exams for ethics and governance. They're not available yet. We only released them in week seven. Uh, so tips on indexing, but definitely with indexing, uh, I'll bring up some slides in a minute, but the key is highlight keywords and then write the write those words into an Excel spreadsheet and a definition, and then in the exam, sort it by alphabetical order and by page number. Can I have the slides you had just now? Yes, they're in the main course. You log into the main course and let me, I'll, I'll show you what that might look like in just a minute if I can bring that up. So if you go along to the main course, you log in, Ethics and Governance, click on that. Then you'll see all of these areas, right? So you'll see study plans and exam preparation. So it shows you what to do. Weekly webinars are listed there, winter school, and here are all the modules. So you just click on this button, start course or continue course. Once you've done that, you'll see all our units down the side. And from there, you get uh, mark the units complete. And this is where you see all of the content. So you will see week one preparation, and it'll tell you what to read, and that's where the video is, and that's where the recording is. All right, so uh, for those of you who have been with Knowledge Equity for a while and know how all this system works, have a, have a wonderful night and a great day. And for the rest of you, please stick around for five minutes and you can ask any questions you want about who we are, what we do, how to navigate the site, and I'll help you out.